Um, good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the second panel of our conference on working time reductions and the climate crisis, which is entitled the place of the working time reduction in a post growth society. Um, for this panel, we have invited three experts from academia to provide their expertise on the complex relationship between working time reductions and carbon emissions and the importance of shorter working times as one of the key policies driving the socio-ecological transformation towards a more sustainable and fair society. I will be sharing this session. My name is Philip Fry. I'm a scientific employee at the Institute for Technology Assessment and System Analysis in Karlsruhe. And most of my research is focused on the future of work in the age of automation, but also on the ecological limits of work in this context. I'm also here to represent the German Center for Emancipatory Technology Studies, a young technopolitical think tank, which is an institutional member of the European Network for the Fair Sharing work of Working Time, which is hosting this conference. Just a quick reminder, like all other sessions, this session will be recorded. Feel free to ask any questions you might have throughout the presentations via the Q&A button, button at the bottom of your screen. If you um, experience any technical difficulties, we have two people um, helping out, which is Alexander, which is supporting the moderation for this panel, and Thoril Dua, which is running the tech support throughout the whole conference. And they will be happy to help you with any questions you might rise, raise through the chat. Before I give the floor to our speakers, I will very briefly introduce them. Our first speaker is going to be uh, Juliet Shaw. Juliet is professor of sociology at Boston College. Before joining Boston College, she taught at Harvard University for 17 years in the Department of Economics and the Committee on Degrees in Women's Studies. Her research focuses on consumption, time use, the relationship between work and family life, and the relation between working hours, inequality, and carbon emissions. Over the years, she has received numerous honors and written some of the defining publications on the issue of working time reductions and ecological sustainability. In her talk, she will introduce us to the relationship between carbon emissions and hours of work, which is central to our conference. Our second speaker will be Will Strong. Will is one of the co-founders of Autonomy and its director of research. Autonomy is an independent progressive think tank that focuses on the future of work and economic planning and has been running a research stream on shorter working times since its inception. Will is also currently writing an introduction to the topic of post-work together with Helen Hester, which is scheduled to be hopefully released next year, and uh, will present on the question how working time reductions might contribute to a healthy relationship between post-growth and post-work approaches. And last but not least um, will be Beate Zimpelmann. Beate is a professor in political science and sustainability studies at the University of Applied Sciences in Bremen. Before moving to academia, she was in charge of energy and environmental policy at the IG Metall, and later on head of the program on work and the environment of the Senate administration of Berlin. Beato also serves on the scientific advisory board of ATTAC. Her research has been focused on issues of sustainable work, both in a national and an international perspective, transdisciplinary research, and of course, working time reduction. She will be discussing the issue to what extent shorter working times are a precondition for societal change and the good life we all seek. We will hear all three inputs at once because they are closely connected and then we will have an, around an hour for the Q&A sessions. So please, Juliet, if you could start, I hand you the floor. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is such an important topic. So, um, I want to begin by making a strong claim, which is that uh, for wealthy countries, it's impossible to sufficiently decarbonize without getting onto a path of work time reduction. Um, why is this true? Well, first, I think we, when I use the word sufficiently, um, I mean it both in terms of um, uh, existing targets for emissions reductions and also global equity issues. So I think we, we need to be thinking about roughly 10% reductions in wealthy countries in greenhouse gas emissions annually, which is an enormous, enormous uh, task to get that level of, of reduction. 
Um, it's a really inordinate amount of reducing, but is uh, fair in terms of historic emissions as well as differentiated ca uh, capacities for emissions, uh, largely due to uh, income inequalities between global north and south. So the first point really is to say that energy system transformation, which is an absolutely obviously necessary part of uh, decarbonization, energy system transformation, that is the shift to clean renewable energy is not enough if uh, to achieve these emission reductions if energy demand is growing. And uh, that's been a big part of the problem, which is that we've had a technological approach uh, to energy system transformation, but not an approach to control energy demand. And that's where we really need to focus and that's where working hours comes in. So the key issue is a, a series of relationships, the relationship between work hours and GDP, and then the relationship between GDP and emissions. And so I wanna go through those uh, uh, separately. Let me start with uh, GDP uh, emissions link. So um, the first point to make is that the relationship between GDP or output and emissions remains strong, especially in some countries, and especially when we include what we call the offshoring of emissions or the offshoring of carbon through trade. So the fact that uh, Europe and uh, North America have uh, reduced their emissions in part by um, importing increasingly dirty, uh, high carbon embodied uh, products and exporting lower carbon embodied products. So the national accounts are really not the way to look at this. You need to do uh, what we call consumption accounting, which includes the exports and imports of the countries. So that's the first point. The second point is that this crucial uh, relationship of, of uh, GDP to emissions is uh, not moving in the direction that the sort of mainstream discourse or the people who are thinking this is primarily a technological or an energy system problem. Uh, have been arguing for, and that is uh, so-called decoupling. So the delinking of GDP and emissions. All of the sort of mainstream strategies of green growth, for example, or a, a, a very technologically centered approach to emissions reductions, which is what we have seen in most countries until recently, where that that finally begins to open up that that sort of stranglehold on policy and the political discourse, um, the, uh, that decoupling is not happening to the, uh, any significant extent. So uh, a recent review of all the decoupling studies just found there's no significant evidence of robust decoupling, meaning that emissions and GDP are still linked. So that if we are in a growing, uh, you know, an environment of GDP growth, it means we're also in an environment of emissions growth, everything else equal. And so what we have with GDP expansion is basically a factor pulling us in the other direction and eroding or eating away or undermining all the gains that we're making by the energy transformations that are certainly happening and happening you know, at, at a relatively good rate in, in a number of countries. So moving off fossil fuels onto non-fossil sources of energy. Uh, a recent estimate from 2017 is that we need uh, 2.5 times more GDP per ton of uh, material resources um, than, uh, uh, for, for each, for each uh, uh, unit of GDP, we still need 2.6 uh, times uh, material resources, which gives us no pathway to even a two degree warming, uh, much less uh, 1.5 via a pure decoupling path. There's another really important point here from the research, which is increasingly renewables are looking like they contribute to 
increased energy demand rather than just substituting for fossil fuels. There's, there's often an un, unspoken assumption in the debate that you'll get a one-to-one -one substitution uh, when you add renewables. But in fact, what's happening is you get expansion of, of energy demand. And so renewables are not undermining emissions to the extent that many people had hoped. So this is a bitter pill, I know, um, but the, we really have to accept that we've got to control the demand for energy, period. We cannot grow without emitting yet, so we've really got to slow down that growth and reduce energy demand. Okay, so how do we do that and what does that mean about uh, hours of work? So let's assume that we are able to get a political consensus or for whatever reason, we get to a point of roughly stable GDP. So we're not expanding GDP in real terms. And I'm talking, I'm talking only about real terms, not uh, prices. So there will be price changes and so forth. But what is, let, let's say we're in a, we're in a that slower no growth uh, GDP situation. What does that mean about hours of work? So, and why am I arguing that it implies we need to reduce hours of work? So the first thing we need to think about is the productivity work time GDP relationship. Economies are typically generating ongoing productivity increases. If GDP is not expanding, then productivity growth can either create unemployment or reduce hours of work. I mean, in fact, both of those are Unemployment is a reduced uh, hours of work outcome, but it's just not a good way to do it. Um, the inevitable, so what, what is happening then is for a given level of output, we can produce it with fewer hours of work. Firms will hire those, uh, will only employ those fewer hours of work. And so there's gonna be uh, reduced work time in one way or another. Now, of course, if we do it in a, in an intentional way, it's going to be very different than just creating unemployment among a growing number of people. Uh, a side point, we may want to get into this in the discussion, is that robotization, artificial intelligence, et cetera, likely accelerates this trend because it raises labor-saving productivity, uh, because it creates labor-saving productivity growth. And, and that's something that we have to deal with even uh, outside of the the emissions reduction context. So what we want to think about is a kind of forward-looking program in which we take productivity increases and translate them into shorter hours of work. So we finance a, a shorter hour of work program through productivity growth. Now, let me just turn for a minute to the existing research on uh, emissions and, and working hours. And I've, I've been looking at this for a number of years. Uh, my first uh, modeling on this was done in 2013. And what we find, um, and there's now a pretty growing literature on this, uh, mostly from sociologists, but also economists. Uh, what we find is that um, in virtually all the studies, Working hours are correlated, uh, they are positively correlated with carbon emissions. So countries with higher working hours have higher carbon emissions. Over time, as working hours rise, carbon emission rises, uh, carbon emissions rise and vice versa. So lower hours are associated with lower emissions. And this is true across countries. Uh, I've done analyses for the United States looking across U.S. states where we're also finding that there are some studies at the household level which also suggest that households who work longer hours have higher carbon emissions holding things constant. And there are sort of two big uh, dimensions of this. One is the one I started talking about, which is the GDP relationship. And I, I've called this the scale effect. And it has to do with the size of the economy or the scale of the economy. So more higher working hours, all things equal, gives you a larger size economy. That additional production creates more emissions. It's a really simple story in that sense. Um, the composition effect occurs at the household level. And what 
what that argues basically is that households who are more time stressed, who have longer hours of work, all other things equal, have higher emissions because typically uh, the use of carbon, high carbon uh, activities uh, tends to be time saving. So transportation is the most important of these. The faster you wanna get somewhere, the more carbon you have to use. Time stressed households tend to wanna to do things more quickly. Um, and it's also true that certain kinds of sustainable act behaviors and practices are more time consuming than uh, less sustainable versions of them. So more and more research showing this uh, relationship between hours of work and emissions. Um, just in, uh, I just got a, a couple of minutes left. So I wanna make uh, a couple, two more points. The first one is another way of thinking about this is if you want to control emissions, if you want to get those robust uh, emissions reductions that I started with at 10% a year, say, um, you're going to have to keep purchasing power out of the economy. Because if you give people money, they will spend it. Um, there are strong social pressures for upscaling consumption. Uh, consumption is something that people value. and uh, you know, much of the sort of sustainable consumption community in some countries, my own, especially the United States, I think, has approached people with a sort of moralistic uh, approach saying, you know, save the planet, consume less. And um, I think this is not a successful strategy, um, appealing to people's uh, environmental sense or their moral sense <clears throat> and just asking them not to spend money that they have. It just doesn't accord with a lot of evidence we have about uh, the way the way our economies work. I think if we want to move households and individuals to lower uh, consumption, which ultimately or lower material consumption or even just uh, stable consumption, We've got to do it through a different kind of configuration, and that is by giving people time rather than money. And if we do that, you know, Will, Will or Beata may talk about this. Uh, there's a strong quality of life argument for doing that, but asking people to sacrifice by spending less doesn't work. Um, so what we want to do is kind of reconfigure the way the economy works and rather than have what I call the work and spend cycle in which productivity growth gets more or less automatically translated into more income, more hours of work, hours of work, income spending, we want to um, break that link between productivity growth and output expansion. And so you want to build in mechanisms that take that productivity growth and translate it into hours, uh, shorter hours of work. That's really key. Um, in the post-war period, there were labor contracts which explicitly tied wages to productivity growth. What we could do now is explicitly tie shorter hours to productivity growth so that we get a structural mechanism, a kind of automatic mechanism for driving down hours of work rather than expanding output. Um, so how do we do it? I think that Will and Beata will, you know, may talk about this more. The four-day work week, of course, is uh, a very popular option. Um, but I've also, I also uh, would argue that we need a kind of diverse approach that gives more, people more choice in how to take shorter hours of work, in contrast to what we had historically, which was a common schedule. Uh, moving through reduced hours of work. So first reduced Sunday work, then reduced Saturday work, then reduced nighttime work. Um, I also think there are, there are important legal protections, uh, new uh, time rights that uh, states can grant to people, as for example, the Netherlands has done with a right to work less within the job that you have. One of the important um, 
uh, findings of economic research in the United States is that if people want to work less, typically they have to change jobs and they'll typically have to go to less desirable jobs. So giving people a right to work less within the job that they have, which is something that's enshrined in Dutch law now, is really important. And finally, uh, high income professionals are one group that does desire trade offs between money and time. And we want to design policies that give people that right. So um, last point here, because I've, I've run out of time. There's another really important connection that I've worked uh, on in my own modeling and uh, my students and colleagues are also doing more work on this. And that is to bring in the role of inequality because one of the things we find is that number one, more unequal societies have longer hours of work, all other things equal. And number two, at higher levels of inequality, the work time emissions connection turns out to actually be stronger. So a robust policy of work time reduction should also include robust policies to reduce inequality, and that will, that will actually have um, follow-on effects uh, for reducing hours of work. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, first, for presenting us with the bitter pills and giving us an idea how big the challenges actually are. And also for providing this perspective that simply telling people to consume less is maybe not good enough, but that you have to, well, offer them at least a, um, well, leisure um, in, in return. Um, I would um, give over now directly to Will Strong. And yeah, you have the floor, Will. Awesome, thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, um, we'll just start this. Great, yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm very proud to say that autonomy is part of um, the network for, for the fair sharing of working time, the European network. Um, I'm sure it's been said a lot, but we're interested in having new members, new discussions, so please join the network and get involved. So Autonomy is a research organization uh, based in the UK. I'm the director of research and uh, we, we, we produce policy and research on all sorts of things to do with the future of work. So we've been looking at welfare, commuting, um, the platform economy, but also the shorter working week and the shorter working week has been the focus of ours since the beginning, as uh, Philip said. I haven't been introduced as an academic for many for, for many months, so that's it was nice to hear, I suppose, but I don't really do that anymore. I'm, I'm mainly focused on working time policy. Okay, so I thought for my talk, I think just looking at, you know, what we arranged for this conference, I thought it would make sense to step back from policy um, for a second, and I would advise people go and, and see the session tomorrow with the four day week campaign and uh, other campaigns. But I thought I'd step back and talk about post growth and uh, in conversation with an emergent kind of discourse that's, that's been coming around for the last five years that I've been engaging with called post work. And I think there's a way there's in which these these two different discourses parallel each other. And I think they have very strategic and theoretical um, implications. I mean, first off, both of them have names which are fighting an uphill battle, as it were. It's hard to disagree with uh, work in a work-centered society, and it's hard to, to disagree with growth uh, in a growth-centered society. So both of them have these kind of uphill battles, which I think are necessary and important, but it does put them on the back foot. And I think there's ways in which both can learn from each other. So what do I mean by, by post-work? Well, I suppose that the motto for something like post-work is revalue, redistribute, and reduce. It's more of a provocation than anything else. It's not really a detailed program. It's more a set of family resemblances between texts and authors. I'm talking about people like Kathy Weeks. I'm talking about Nick Cernacek, uh, Helen Hester, authors who have to take an unromantic view of the world of work, um, who have kind of either historical perspective or a, or a gender, uh, a gender kind of um, studies uh, perspective or um, a kind of much more futurist perspective. And the, the point of post-work is, is, is to really provoke uh, desire and estrangement from the present. So thinking not just in terms of jobs and employment, but also beyond that. So the work of the home, the unpaid work of the home, often very gendered, shadow work like commuting or, or kind of consumer work that we do in order to, to buy our products and so on. And normally post-work is, is premised on precarity, uh, overwork, climate change, all these different crises. It's a very crisis-based um, discourse. 
much like post growth is to some extent. It's much less established than post growth, but it's something which is kind of gaining traction in, 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 in certain ways. It's normally clustered around a few policies or demands. So things like a basic income, how to manage things like automation, Juliet mentioned AI and machine learning and so on. So a lot of the post work literature and research is around uh, kind of how to repurpose different technologies. But also, I'd say almost primarily the shorter working week and reducing working time, not just in the workplace, but also working time at home is, is perhaps its, its uh, telos, its purpose, its main um, goal. And I think, you know, although not in name, no one's really heard of post work, I think in, in terms of practicalities, um, uh, post work is, is getting traction in political and public spheres. So I, I, would, I would count autonomy being part of that discussion. So, you know, whether it's creating this policies or whether it's campaigns like the four day week campaign uh, in the UK, but also abroad in Spain and Ireland and, and so on. Um, these these are getting real traction, and they, they kind of are kind of capturing some of the public imagination. So, so that's kind of an interesting point to I, I want to return to later around how post growth can kind of um, work with kind of post work kind of um, uh, elements. Now, I think just some obvious points of contact between post growth and post work uh, is, of course, that reducing working time is key to both. Um, I think, you know, just considering the fact, for example, Juliet's work has been incredibly, incredibly influential on, on, on my own work and others as well. Um, I think an interesting shared nexus is between is around productivity. It's a dangerous frame from the from a post work perspective because it's a stick to beat workers with, to be more productive. That's the aim of the economy, to be more productive. And who gets who gets the, uh, the sharp end of that? It's those who are working in the workplace. But equally, from a post-growth perspective, it's an environmentally catastrophic direction. So, so I think there's a, there's a confluence there around the idea that maybe post-work should be abandoned as the final final aim of, of, of an economy, basically. Productivity and also growth as well. And um, Will, you have 11 minutes left. You can slow down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, sorry. I have to realize that as a, um, I'm a very fast native English speaker, so I, I will slow down. Although I have a fair bit to get to. Okay, and then finally, of course, there is also a convergence around revaluing work, revaluing certain forms of work. And I'll, I'll return to COVID uh, at the very end of the presentation, but of course, both post-growth perspectives and post-work perspectives want to revalue work and certain kinds of work, um, uh, which has basically become either uh, naturalized, kind of denigrated, or, or, or kind of um, yeah, not, not valued half as much as they should have been. For example, care work, that's not very carbon intensive, but also it's something which you know, we should emphasize is basically the foundation of our economies. Okay, so I think I think a key shared message, and this is really, you know, Juliet's previous presentation underlined this very well, is basically that work and consumption intersect. Now, I think um, there's obviously an interesting point to be made about offshoring energy. Um, but of course, I'm just going to point to some of our research from earlier this year, where uh, Dinesh Sala, who's a, a an energy specialist based in the north of England. Um, and an interesting study we carried out just as COVID was hitting was looking at daily consumption of electricity. When, were the, when was the peak times for electricity consumption? Um, and we compared weekends, bank holidays and weekdays. And we looked at, you know, effectively the, the demand on an energy system and to show the kind of contrast between non-working days in terms of employment, non-employment days and employment days and bank holidays. And, and what we found is that there was a huge reduction of uh, electricity consumption on the weekends. And so we started running some hypothetical tests, you know, with regards to what if we had a four day week? What if we had another day of the weekend? How much electricity would we uh, save or how much, would we, how much less would we consume electricity? Um, uh, over a year, and uh, effectively, what we what we found was that there would be a 24% re reduction in the carbon emissions based from based on electricity consumption in the UK every year. It's quite a huge difference, and a reduction of 5% across the whole sector, simply just from adding another week uh, a weekday weekend day, sorry, to the week. And that's not including all the other consumption that Juliet's research has shown. So things like carbon intensive goods, uh, commuting, and so on. This is simply just the amount of electricity that we use on weekends versus weekdays. So I think there's something to be said there where we kind of, this kind of research brings together a kind of uh, working time reduction perspective and a post-growth perspective. Okay, and so I, I want to kind of run through a few um, 
ways in which both movements can kind of inform each other, basically. So on the one hand, uh, post-work perspectives can inform a post-growth movement uh, in a number of ways. I think um, po post-work authors are very keen to avoid a return to nature narrative. The idea that basically, you know, to some extent, humankind or modern civilization is somehow um, done, done, kind of erred against nature in some way. And all we, need to do, we do is return back to a kind of natural or um, kind of, yeah, a return, a return in some sense. I think that's quite dangerous. And I think the post-work perspective driven by a, a, a feminist concern for uh, uh, gender roles. So things such as, you know, naturalizing women's work as, as reproductive work, for example, um, I think that there's a way in which post-work can steer some of those slightly more naturalist perspectives that sometimes infiltrate post-growth perspectives. Um, I think this is to, to pick up what Juliet was talking about earlier around um, uh, desirability and not just telling people to not consume more. I think post-work can offer a vision of hope to a project, essentially a project of scaling back. If we do need to scale back our consumption and our production, we also need to give people hope to, to kind of buy into that. And so I think when, when Philip said something like um, sustainable and fair world, we also need a fun one, basically. We need one where we can have a, to, to use Kate Soper's term, um, uh, kind of alternative hedonism in some sense, something which is kind of a leisure beyond consumption kind of model. I think post work is, is and, and the kind of literature around that is kind of, can, can inject that into, into a, um, a post growth uh, discourse, which can sometimes sound quite austere. We need to kind of steer away from that. And that's what Juliet was saying as well. And I think importantly, and, and I think this can be said also, the same can be said of Green New Deal perspectives. Um, I think it's important to avoid a mass work narrative. So sometimes, um, you know, for example, in, in, in Anne Petipal's new book on the Green New Deal, there's, there's the idea of like of an arm, there's a, there's a phrase, an army of labor. It's used uh, again and again, in fact, you know, I think, I think Ed Miliband, an MP in the UK, talked about there needs to be a kind of an army of labor, um, of laborers. And so I think, although, you know, mass employment is something which right now in particular we're, a lot of people are demanding. It's important to remember that work perhaps isn't the final goal of our, of our society, it's a means to an end. So I think post-work can add that kind of caution. And what can post-growth add to, to, to post-work? To post so I think post-growth for me is potentially a, a, a useful wider frame, like post-scarcity. Post-growth uh, post is, is perhaps a wider frame for a direction of, of, of national economies that post-work can plug into. So often, you know, post-work is really focused on working time, you know, different forms of work and so on, but it hasn't really got a wider um, kind of framework or trajectory. I think post-growth can provide that. I think it's useful for post-growth perspectives to define green jobs and green work. That's something which, that's, that's, that's a kind of initiative that needs to happen. I think post-growth can do that. Um, I think post-growth can kind of put some important cautions to some of the technological optimism or aspirations that come out of post-work dis discourse. I think it's important to, to, to keep an environmental frame um, and a post-growth frame on top of, of some of that kind of um, sometimes techno-futurism. I think as, as Juliet um, and Philip also picked up on, thinking through leisure that's not carbon intensive. So if post-work is, is really about free time, um, then what does that free time look like and how do we make it not um, carbon consumptive? And finally, a final note on COVID. COVID, as, as, as far as I'm aware, as far as the research seems to show, it's not going away anytime soon. We have perhaps one, at least one or two years on a, on a similar, unless we find a vaccine, um, it's gonna be around for a long time perhaps forever, but not quite as intensive as this. So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to rethink work because this really is a crisis of work. This is not, it's quite different to 2008 in that sense. That's a subprime mortgage crisis and so on. This is really a crisis of work, of what kind of work we value and what kind of work uh, we don't value basically. So, so and, and, and in terms of working time, there's an interesting, there are a few interesting um, dynamics, right? There's some people who working from home, they tend to be working longer work and life bleed into each other. And those who, who are in industries that are really tanking and they can't get enough work. This is an opportune moment to think about redistribution of hours, right? And I think if you look back in history, and this is some of the research I've been doing recently around the history of working time reduction in the UK, the most significant moments of this reduction have been uh, after um, the world, first and second world war, led by trade unions, led by the workers movement, but really after absolute crises of, um, uh, or economic crisis effectively. Now, so I think it's important to note, and I think it's a slight, maybe I'm speaking slightly differently, um, in slightly different 
terms as Juliet here, that although some, you know, some, particularly when the working term reduction initiative gets uh, attacked, I think basically uh, some uh, people say we, we can't have working term reduction without a very productive economy, or we need to have a more prosperous economy to have working term reduction. But I think it's important to note that after World War One and World War Two, it's not as if our economies were in any good, decent shape. And we should, we should note that actually the greatest reductions of working time have happened in times of um, economic hardship. So in, in those particular scenarios, so I think we should, we should avoid the idea of the kind of being cornered into saying that actually you can only have working time reduction when we have um, economic um, prosperity. Because I think I'm not sure how, you know, when that's going to be basically. And finally, in the short term, you know, working time demands have to be made in the context of COVID. I think that's really important and we're having some success in doing that. But I think also, you know, if we establish working time reduction coming out of COVID or coming out of this intense period of COVID, then um, uh, I think it, we should, it should be there for, for, we should be established for the longer term transition uh, that we require, basically. Cool. I'll leave it there. Sorry if I spoke too far. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it was quite fine um, after in the second half. Yeah, um, thank you so much for, I, I, I found this encounter of post work thinking and um, post growth thinking um, very um, inspiring. And I just wanted to remind everyone that you are invited to use the Q&A button to um, head in questions through the talks already because we have three talks in a row so it might be good to just note them down already now instead of waiting until the very end. Okay, um, finally I give the floor to Beate. Ah, yeah. Um, did anyone? Uh, so, thank you okay. very much. Ah. I hope yes. you can understand me now. Okay, yes. I want to share my screen now. I will try it. I hope it will function. Um, so, can you see the presentation? Please say yes. Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. Not yet in oh. uh, full screen, but um, yes. as okay. soon as you start. So, okay. So I will start now. Um, working time um, and we are, will speak about the place of working time reduction in the post growth society. And I will put the question, is it a precondition for change and an expression of good life? And to answer that, I have divided my presentation into three parts. First part, working time and gender second part, working time and sustainability, and third part, working time, transformation and post growth So we will begin with the comparison of working hours of men and women in Germany. And uh, I will show you a survey of the Hans Böckler Stiftung and you see the working time of men is mostly 40 hours and more. The blue um, scare is um, the, the uh, part-time working and it is very slow. So we have 90% of working time in the full-time job when you look at the men. And when you look at the women, you have a completely other picture. You see most of the time is part-time, more than 50% are part-time and the violet area, which is over 40 hours is very small and compared to the men, it was much more. So this leads to the gender time gap and Germany has a very big gender ga time gap of 7.7 .7 hours. And it is very high in comparison to the others of the EU, which have 5.4. And you see, for example, there are less countries which have more, but we all in the EU have this gender time gap. I think this everybody knows this, but it is necessary, I think, to show it in this extreme form. And then when you look, look on, then you see that um, paid and unpaid work is, it's not surprising, women do the most of the unpaid work and men do most of the paid work. With all the consequences this has on money they get, 
and on insurance and all of that. So I come to my first thesis. I have so a thesis, um, a shortening of working time is needed in the context of gender justice. And my second thesis is a shortening of working time in a full-time employment is demanded by both gender. And to prove that, I show you a survey of um, the VSE of the Hans Böckler Stiftung. And there you can see that men who work in full time, they were, want to work less hours and women who work in full time the same. They also want to work less hours. And part time, part time employees, they want to work more, the men and the women. It's very similar. It differs a little bit between the gender. So, what has this to do with sustainability? Perhaps you ask yourselves, we will see later. Working time and sustainability. I want to go a little bit to history. Um, the limits of growth, 1972, was the beginning of the debate with the survey of Meadows, the limits to growth, and he said, our model of industrial development is not sustainable. Then we came to the Bundland definition to the Bundland report, sustainable development, and with this sentence, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The next step is the declaration of Rio. Principle one, human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. And there we see, we have nature, we have human beings, and we have the economy, the productive life. And this leads to the circle, to the triangle of sustainability. Sustainability together, economy and environmental justice and social justice. And there is, um, a competition between the three and we have some who say okay we only can do economic efforts if the economy economy is running and we have others who say oh it's too late we have just environmental borders and this are this is the point this is the limiting point and everything which can we can do with economy we have to do beyond these borders. We remember the famous sentence of Greta Thunberg, which she says, how you dare it, uh, how can you dare it? So this is one theoretical point, which is the caring economy in Germany, for example, uh, Adelaide Wiesecker, she is a very famous one, which has this theory and she says caring economy emphasizes that nature shows absolute shortage and that some resources are not substitutable that's the point of strong sustainability and this means it is a cooperative approach which takes natural and social conditions as a basis and the analysis focus on the relation between nature and humans it's in german you say it's the it's very close together, the social and the natural point. So what does it mean for work? There are two points which are important. I think Juliet Shaw said it already. One is approximately 80% of the carbon dioxide emissions of human activities come into existence by gainful employment. And this means that the gainful employment is not ecological. We need a change. And this means a change of work. Of the, we need the ecology of work. We need a change of the working hours, but we also need a change of the kind of work. I will come later to that point. And the second is that there is a link between economic growth, volume of work and productivity, it was already also said of Juliet Shaw. And because of that, the economists say that we need economic growth to safeguard employment. And this is in contrast to the ecological demand to save resources and the climate. You can see this 
connection on this grave and uh, that's the point the volume of work got less beginning for 1970 and the productivity becomes bigger and bigger it's 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 uh, increasing more than the increasing of the gdp and because of that we have to share we have to share the volume of work and working time reduction is a chance for fair distribution of the so societal available work and therefore is it a precondition for sustainable development this is my main thesis we have to distribute the work because we can't get more working volume the working volume is is limited and we have the ecological crisis and because of the electric uh, ecological crisis it will get lower and of course of that we have to distribute the available work i think it was no other thing in other words sophie yannicke said in the panel before when she said the metal is now thinking about reducing the working time in four days week 32 hours because they see that it is not possible in the crisis to get more work and they have now the crisis in several uh, sectors like the automobile industry and so they see that the, there is a need to reduce the working time post go society working time transformation and post go society um, several authors mean different things when they talk about post go society i will talk about post go society and in this sense to say post go society focuses on the arrangement of a good life for current generations and future generations Growth can be necessary in some cases, but in general, we grow and we can't get more growth anymore. I agree with that. And new ideas and sufficient life sites are we developing also beyond the market in a post growth society. And the post growth society means a change of work and it means a change of production. And this means inclusion of the reproduction not only the production also the reproduction is necessary to see when we look at work some authors of the post growth society they speak about 20 hours per week when we speak about working hours for example Nico Pech um, we will see that but the focus of my presentation is the idea of the whole work. There are different kinds of work. Not even speak about work, we speak about the paid work, about the gainful employment with the normal employment, part-time employment, a typical work, everything included. But there are also other kinds of work. There's the care work, there's the societal work, and there's the own work. The own work means the work I'm doing for myself, the work I'm doing for my own education, for example, the work I'm doing for culture, if I want to do a course for singing, or uh, if I want to mix parts, all this is work on my own, for my own proceeding, for my own education. And the societal work is the political work, the work I do in, in groups I do to participate in organizations and, and, and. And the care work is the work I do in the family, for example, I do to look for the children, I do to look for the elder ones. And when we look at that and we see that all these four sectors will have the same time, then Frieke Haut, for example, she says, we, don't, we have only the time for four hours of work the day and the other time we have to invest in the other forms of work and this is a complete other definition of work all kinds of work are important and necessary 
the paid and the unpaid work. This shifts the perspective. That's the uh, main point of the, this. And it sees that the societal work, the own work and the care work are necessary and they need time. And now I come to the gender perspective and this kinds of work are mostly done by women. And central is also in this, this point of the care economy, working times must be adjusted to human life processes. And all kinds of work have to be done by every gender. This is the point of working time and post-course society and post-work. And this can only mean a radical reduction of paid work. A shortening of working time means a consequent shift of perspective. Work is considered as a whole work and thus changes the term of work and welfare in general. And we also have another definition of welfare. The welfare of time is important in this model of whole work. I come to my conclusion. The central and initiating role of reduction of working time for a transformation to a post course society is underestimated by political actors. It's underestimated because it's the precondition. And the working time reduction changes the perspective on work and the distribution of work between men and women. And this is also a part of a post growth society. And last but not least, it could disprove the argument that economic growth is needed to safeguard employment because we must stop with the economic growth. And the consequent reduction of working time is the civil and ec ecological project. It is necessary, but it is not enough for the transformation into a post growth society. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm glad to answer your questions. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Beate. Um, I found it really important to also hide the additional dimensions of work besides wage labor. And also that you reinforce the importance of the demand to redistribute working times, uh, particularly if you keep the, the gender time gap in mind and also now the Corona crisis. So thanks a lot. Um, I would also like to thank all three um, presenters um, for keeping the time so well. We really have a full hour now to discuss. So uh, everyone, please um, add uh, your questions to the Q&A segment. Um, Ah, yeah, Juliet needs to be unblocked. Uh, for you, too. could you take care of that? Ah, yeah, okay, good. Um, I would like to start out with one uh, question for each of you, and uh, which also the, this first round also presents you with the opportunity to react to one another. And I would like to um, start with Juliet. Would you like to all get your question and then um, have some time to think about it while uh, one of you is talking. Okay, then I will present all three questions um, at once. So, um, Juliette, we, I was wondering, you said um, we have to drain out purchasing power out of the economy, and you clearly showed that, um, well, simply this level of consumption is not sustainable in the long run. Um, but on the other hand, uh, obviously, the trade unions are always um, campaigning for shorter working times with a full compensation and pay, so no loss in pay. And I wanted to ask whether you could discuss this point a little bit more in detail, maybe also concerning uh, the fact that um, emissions are very unevenly distributed also within developed countries. So maybe, um, uh, and how social and ecological justice could maybe be re reconciled in that respect. And the other thing I wanted to ask uh, to Will, was the um, question which I oftentimes also get is if you argue, okay, shorter working times lead to less reductions, then you are um, confronted with sentiments like, well, if people have more free time, they will always fly to London to go shopping or something like that. And you mentioned that obviously it's um, of key, key importance that um, we also keep the carbon intensity of the additional leisure time we get um, low. So I was wondering, do you think that's mostly a thing of 
a cultural change that people freely pick other activities in their free time off? Or would you say there are certain key policies that would need to be introduced that frame the uh, leisure time of individuals? So yeah. I was wondering whether you could comment on this whole issue, which is called temporal rebound effect. Yeah. And lastly, to Beate, um, you're, I know that you're also involved with research on sustainability in a global um, context and perspective. And um, I was wondering when Juliet mentioned that the decoupling is simply not happening as quickly as we need, so that the connection between GDP growth and um, carbon emissions remains too strong, um, what that means for global development and whether you would like to comment in that respect, what also uh, whether working time reduction is a sensible policy also in the global south or whether you would say the discussion we are having here is mostly centered on the global north. Okay, Juliette, would you like to start? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. So I think that um, I sort of couched my conversation in a sort of almost more of a modeling frame. Uh, so now we need to um, enhance it with some more realism and so forth. So you're right that uh, we really need to focus on inequality of wealth and emissions uh, for two reasons. I mean, one is that you have this very unequal distribution of emissions where with people at the top uh, contributing very disproportionately to emissions. This is particularly true on a global scale, but it's also true within nations. Um, and then you have another finding, which we have from our, uh, my colleagues and I have, that where you have a lot of income and wealth concentration at the very top, so top 1%, 5%, or 10% concentration, you actually have higher emissions, other things held equal. That was that point I made at the very end. So I think that in part, uh, you can have uh, reductions in inequality that may help offset some of the demand from trade unions for income increase increases in income but ultimately if you have already if you're starting from a fairly equal society like many of the northern european uh, countries already are um that the that you know, doing too much downward redistribution can actually lead to more demand uh, and, and higher emissions because you're, you're moving money from people with low propensity to spend to higher propensity to spend. So you got to think about that. Um, I think that the, uh, the way I would think about this is it's not about reducing uh, incomes. It's about leveling out incomes on average, and then taking productivity growth in the form of shorter hours of, of work. The Netherlands did this for 15 years from roughly the recession of 1980-82, which was a very severe recession, very high unemployment in Europe, until the sort of late 90s. So real wages almost didn't rise at all. Productivity increased a lot, and their working hours went down a lot. They went to a four-day work week in the finance sector. They, uh, the, the government hired all new employees on four-day schedules. So that, that's kind of the way to do it, especially where you get the, the uh, new workers entering the labor force. If they go on to shorter schedules, they never, they're never experiencing those five-day work weeks. Obviously, this doesn't work for the very lowest paid. And that's where you do want to bring the bottom up. So if you combine these policies with um, either welfare policies, minimum wage, or you know other things which basically compress the income distribution, um, they can be successful uh, to deal with some of those issues that we're talking about, uh, which is the, the uh, purchasing power. But but ultimately, you know, drain more purchasing power out of the top, yes. But the point is that we're going to have to, we're going to have to really make uh, deals with unions which allow them to take work, shorter work time uh, rather than 
then uh, increases at least a portion of the productivity increase that way if we're if we're going to meet those emissions targets. I, I don't see another way around it. Unless we get a you know phenomenal uh, a hail mary technology, yeah, you know, and that that may be. I mean, you the the more you do on the technological side, the more you do on the shifting the uh, mix of services, the more you do the kinds of things Beata is talking about, where you're shifting to more care work and low carbon activities, then the less purchasing power you have to kind of pull out of the system. I mean, that's you always have those trade offs. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, on the other hand, uh, the good thing is that um, in comparison to warp reactor for free energy without emissions or something like that, um, work and time reductions already exist as a policy option, basically. But uh, it's true, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Will, would, would you like to go next? Sure, yeah. I, mean, I think in terms of um, non, well, non-carbon intensive leisure, I would and responding to the question, would we not just be increasing our kind of carbon use or, or, or whatever uh, in our leisure time? I mean, I would I would also just point back to Juliet's work on, you know, I think there's 27 OECD countries. They looked at the correlation between working time and and carbon emissions, and there's a positive correlation there. So, although although yes, it's not. I'm not saying that leisure can't be carbon consumptive. I, I think, you know, the, the, the point is that work, the more we work, like the less leisure time we have, the more time stressed we are, the more we use carbon intensive goods. And I think, but that's not to say that we need to, we don't need to change leisure. And I think ultimately what we've been thinking about a lot in autonomy is a kind of leisure, a new leisure infrastructure, because again, to, not to refer back to Juliet's work, the work spend cycle, which I think is a really useful phrase, um, it's actually reflected in space as well. So, you know, our, our town centers, particularly in the UK, it's, it's, I'm sure elsewhere in the US, of course, the places to go when you have more free time are often places to spend, right? And, and that we're the, the kind of infrastructure and the architecture of our leisure life is, is a place where it, it's places for consumption. And so I think we can think about decommodified leisure spaces where you know, people can on bank holidays, national holidays, and on their extended free time off, go to places and in, in, enjoy life and have that, whatever I call, you know, the alternative hedonism without having to kind of like, you know, basically like pay for, 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 for high carbon goods. And I think this points to a question I see in the chat, really, when someone says, why, why, what's the explanation for higher carbon consumption on weekdays versus weekends? And I think, you know, we can only really speculate there. The, de the data we we're looking at was looking at the kind of the peak times. And the peak time was a weekday at about 7 p.m. So, so basically, once you're home from work and you've got all, you know, your all your electrical goods going, basically. And why is that not the same on the weekend? Well, maybe, just speculating, maybe it's because on the weekends you're out more, you're going around, you're not using your electrical goods as much because you're actually more active. Um, who knows? But, but ultimately... The peak was 7 p.m. On, on weekdays, and that wasn't the case on weekends or on bank holidays. So I think there's something telling about a 7 p.m. weekday uh, time. I think that tells us it's basically the end of the working day. So employment is, 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 is not good for those electrical consumptions. Anyway. Um, of course, we will uh, also hear Beate with her question, but I was just um, wondering whether the two of you might also want to comment on the link between energy usage and um, what, what might actually explain that, that on weekdays at 7 p.m. Um, the energy consumption is highest. But maybe we'll already address it. Well, remember now you're, you're adding all of these locations that are active. So if you think about on the weekends, that's just basically home-based activity, and then you add all the business-based activity and the retail. But there is one thing. Uh, so I think we can't just assume that if we shift, there will it, it'll be an absolutely proportionate decline. Because one of the things that we saw we've seen in the United States when you shift to the four-day work week is you have work people who pick up additional work on that on that day. And so some of that will generate uh, activity and, and it will generate electricity and so forth. So you, you need to figure out what that, how much of it, it's a, you know, a sort of a rebound kind of effect, how much of it you'll get. That the, that the shift 
uh, will cause some new activity. Mm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Beate, um, we didn't reach your question yet, but um, yeah. Yes, um, Philip, you asked me um, if working time reduction is only concept for the global north. Um, I'm very often asked this question. I think we have to look firstly at post course economy. And post course economy is a concept which is we, we have to look for economist concepts which are locally orientated, which are regional orientated. And we have to establish an economy which suits, which fits to the local situation. And when we look at that, then for example, look to India, look to in Bangladesh, what is happening there in the te textile industry. You have very, very hard working conditions. You have very, very uh, less wages. You have working hours which are long, which are in the night and then end. So I think we have there other problems. We have problems to do with the working condition, with the kind of work, with the condition of work. And for that, strong unions are important in this country and we have to fight for fair wages. For example, in the textile sector in India, this is a field where I am in research with, and um, the working time reduction is so not a concept which we can say this fits for every country, this fits for every region, because we have to look very exactly what is happening and what are the conditions there, and so working time would uh, reduction is a concept, yes, primarily for the global north, for the European Union, and we look in other countries which uh, in the uh, global south, then we have to look a little bit more in detail and we have to look at the work and at the condition of work and of the kind of work. And I think when we talk about working time reduction and post for society and sustainable development, I said it, it's not the only thing to say we reduce the working time and then we have to get less emissions. We have to look at the kind of production we have and we have to change the kind of production we have. And this is also so important then to change, to reduce the working times. We have to think these both things together. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would start to take questions now from the audience, if that's fine with you, or um, if you, uh, you, you can still react to one another's input, but uh, since you didn't choose to do so, I, I, I would suggest I start with um, questions from the audience. Um, the first one I'd like to highlight is um, uh, from uh, Katie Wiese, and she's asking about the experience that um, they oftentimes, when talking about um, uh, working time reductions, they get comments from policymakers on how to finance working time reductions in the long term. And I think actually that refers to the financing also of the welfare state, because much of the expenses of the welfare state today are linked to gainful employment and the taxation of that. And um, the question would be if you maybe also say, okay, we have to drain out um, purchasing power from the economy. How do you make sure that not in the end, you basically leave um, um, no money left for um, public services and these kind of things? I think the question could be taken up by any of you and all. I, I, one thing I, I did want to pick up on Juliet's presentation, but I thought, I'd already picked up on a question from the audience. I didn't want to keep picking up on stuff. <laughs> was was linked to this question basically. So, you know, I've been doing some work recently on maximum wages and the redistributive power of maximum wages, and I, I feel more and more that we basically need to talk about redistribution um, as as a part as a as a way of um, discussing working time reduction. And I say that in contrast to the idea, perhaps to what Juliet was saying around tying it to productivity gains. Just so, in some ways, the question I had is in lieu in in lieu of productivity gains, in 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 light of economies which are basically stalling. How do we 
how do we make this case? And I think to some extent it's pointing to the to inflicting the global north, you know, very unequal pies basically, and and really pushing that inequality angle. And so I think my yeah, my question is how do you feel about that as a redistribution rather than kind of like growing the pie? Um, and I think for me, the maximum wage, you know, we, we've done, we've done, and we're going to include more of this in our calculations around what could a maximum wage, a redistributive maximum wage or pay ratio, what could it finance in terms of time as well as money, basically. Um, and so I think there's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I think as, I mean, Julia already did mention the kind of squeeze that might be necessary, which I think is a good way of putting it, a minimum and a maximum. So I just wondered what her thoughts were, because I kind of concur with, with Katie in a way that some of those proposals are good, good ideas. Yeah, can I, I, there are a lot of the questions in the chat actually relate to the question of productivity. And this is a place where Will and I, you know, put out different points of view to a certain extent. I think it's really important. Um, it's very important to distinguish between two things. One is work intensification and the other is productivity growth. Now, in the conventional economics uh, approaches and in uh, the statistics, those two are not uh, differentiated. So if people work harder, um, it, will, it will show up as productivity growth, but it's not true productivity growth. It's just working harder. It's because we measure productivity in terms of time rather than intensity of work. This is a really fundamental point. Uh, it's very key to all of the, you know, Marxian theories of labor process where, uh, you know, with wage-based work or time work that's paid by time, not by piece, the intensity of work varies. And so, especially in the UK, I think there's this very anti, there's this kind of sentiment of, it, and one of my friends I think has been, you know, at the forefront on this, Tim Jackson, a productivity growth is bad. And um, I think that's really, really wrong headed. So you do want to distinguish uh, work intensification is bad, but true productivity increase is actually really, really important. And I think it's, I, I just, I don't see how we're going to get to this post-growth or post-work society without it. So, I mean, we could, but I just politically doesn't seem feasible. So the, the, um, uh, so that's the first thing because it allows us to produce more with a, a given level of input. And I'm not sure why that is a bad thing. I mean, yes, there are work reorganizations that are bad and so forth, but the, that's not, sort of the productivity itself is not, I think is not a problem. And you know, a lot of this AI can be really, really helpful. We also have to have robust critiques of AI and of automation and so forth, but not on grounds of employment, not on grounds that they substitute for employment. I think that's a, that's a bad direction to go. Someone in the chat asked, or in the Q&A, asked about service sector and the idea that we don't have productivity growth in the service sector. And I think that's also really not correct. We don't know how to measure productivity growth in the service sector. But I mean, certainly as a service sector worker, I can tell you there are many tools that I have gotten uh, that have dramatically increased my productivity. There are also things that I've learned over my career that have dramatically increased my productivity. I am a much better teacher today than I used to be. I'm a much better advisor today than I used to be. We don't know how to measure it, but it, 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 it's in fact happening. So I think this is really important. I, I think that to, to be a movement that is against productivity growth really will impede us. We have to, we, we really need to I think we need to unpack productivity growth, something I obviously didn't do in my first 15 minutes, but uh, come to a more um, sophisticated and kind of differentiated uh, point of view about it. Um, one um, I, I'd like to interject just very briefly um, to comment. I mean, the, the German trade unions have been doing a lot of research also on intensification of service work and, for example, how many nurses you have per patient and so on. And although it's difficult, I would agree to, to 
evaluate the productivity increases, certainly something has changed compared to 30 years ago or something like that. So I, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, I just, I, I do, let me just say, yeah. I, I want to be clear. I started yeah. my career working on work intensifications. So it, I am not an advocate of work intensification. Uh, but that's where, you know, the whole point was to differentiate true productivity growth from work intensification. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Beate, one question. You talked about the four-in-one perspective of Friga Hauk very shortly also, or you mentioned yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, sometimes in the debate, you also have this position, particularly from, from post-growth or degrowth um, proponents, that if we have way more free time, because we don't have as much um, wage labor time anymore, a lot of services could also be provided privately because people take uh, have more time to take care of their family members, for instance. Um, would you say that uh, could be related to this question of um, um, we might have, uh, well, there might be an issue with providing high quality public services if we um, drain out um, wage labor also partly? Yes, okay. Firstly, I have one uh, demand on, on all three of you. If you can speak a little bit slower, it would be very mm -hmm. fine for me because I'm no native speaker in English and so it's very difficult for yeah. me to follow all the arguments in this quick speed. Um, for in one perspective, um, yes, figure how it's the same. It's similar in this point. Uh, Nico Pech uh, is arguing. Um, it's it's that that we say yes. It is possible that we can do work which is done by foreign people by our own, and this means also this point own work, yes, um, in German Eigenarbeit, because we have a lot of things, for example, repairing my bicycle. I bring my bicycle to the store and then repair, they repair my bicycle. In the society, it is possible that I do more things by my own, which I have led to do from others, because I don't have time. Everything is stressing. I'm working the whole time, so I have, don't have the time to repair my bicycle. I don't have the time to repair my clothes. I don't have the time to do the garden by myself. And um, for these um, activities, I agree, they can be done by their own. But if you look for care uh, work, for example, then you have to look very close which can be done by their own and which can be done by, by others, by organizations, because it can't be that you say all the care work has to be done by your own and um, all you have to do with a older people to care about older people, to care about children and so on. Everything has to do by your own. Then you are in the old uh, argument that you see the women, they stay at home, the care for the children, and um, the men go outside for work. That can't be the solution. And because of that, we say, I say we, because a lot of other people argument in the same way, for example, Adelheid Bisica, we say it is necessary and it's important that the men will do that care work and that um, a societal work too, that it is done by both gender. That's important. And uh, if that is not going, then uh, we have to see that this is no um, approach which is looking into the future. It's, it's a, a approach which is looking into the past. Yeah, I would very much agree. And that perfectly lines up with one of the questions of one of our attendees which actually was about um, the risk that um, working time reductions might actually reinforce gender roles and mm -hmm. which is a process that might be driven by a mix of socioeconomic attributes and he, he was wondering how do we attribute this how do we prevent that actually shorter working time reinforces gender roles yes me yes um I think, first of all, it is necessary that the men work shorter too, and not only the women work shorter, I think. And I think this 
we have a um, development which is going in this direction that the men they want to work less and they want to particip participate in caring about the children for example and um, this is the precondition that it will be for both gender it will be injustice of both gender and um, it can't be that all the unpaid work is done by the woman that is the point but when we have for example i will speak about 20 hours because we can talk the approach of we she says 20 hours working time is enough if all have working time of 20 hours a week all this is the full-time job than you then you have automatically an orientation towards the other kinds of work towards so societal work towards own work and towards care work and so this is the precondition that you have a radical reduction of working time for both gender that is the point will Juliet, would you like to expand or on the question of gender roles is it enough to reduce um, working time for both um, genders or? I mean, do, do you want to go or, or shall I? No, go ahead. No, no, I, I just think it's, it's for me, it's a similar question to, not similar question, sorry, but the response is similar to the one I gave about leisure, which is basically, yes, working time needs to be reduced, but also we need an infrastructure of care which can share that unpaid work out. And this is what Bieta was saying, right? that you know it's it's not just about saying okay you've reduced the working weeks good luck with gender um <laughs> good luck with gendered work it's about saying okay we now have an infrastructure where for example child care elderly care can be shared around so so, so i think a useful concept here is um discretionary time right because free time often is is a broad concept which basically means non-employment but discretionary time is time you know, for our discretion. And so I, I wouldn't say that childcare and elderly care is necessarily discretionary time. And so I would just reiterate what Beate said, basically, which is that it's not just about working time reduction, it's about tackling some of the material um, obstacles to realizing free time, as well as the cultural stuff around what, what's, what's, you know, men, male and female roles. But I think, I think ultimately, it's a question of organization, as well as um, reduction in time. Yeah, I I would. I mean, I I I agree very much with Beata's point of view. I think the you know that one of the things about the gender distributions is that um, here you need additional policy to to make that transformation uh, in terms of. Uh, getting men to do more uptake of care work and so forth. And I do think one of the ways to do that, um, I, I love the point about the Eigenarbeit, which is the own work and the fact that we can't just think of care work as own work. And the, the I mean, I, I am a believer in the um, payment for a lot of this care work. And I think that also makes it more likely that we see more men doing it. So for example, in nursing, uh, which became uh, the, the uh, RNs, the, the top of the nursing uh, hierarchy, um, pay really went up a lot in the United States and you see a lot of men moving into that, into that field. Um, so paying and valuing care work more is, is also part of a gender transformation. But I think the key point is it does it won't happen automatically. That that to really make a big change in the gender distribution of work, you need very um, deliberate policies to kind of force getting that momentum going. Philip, do you mind if I pick up just on something, Julia? No, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it's just that, I mean, the, the more you're speaking, Juliet, the more I realize that like, this is, this is, I think this is what I, my down the line common sense says, which is that we shouldn't intensify work, but we should, you know, use new technologies to kind of boost productivity and then share that around so we can have more time for ourselves and so on. I'm just 
more and more, I'm just thinking we're kind of chasing a solution to a productivity puzzle, particularly in, I mean, the UK, we have a real productivity puzzle and it's partly with all sorts of reasons, you know, unproductive firms in the middle section of, of the economy or it's low paid work. So we don't have, we don't invest in new technologies um, and so on. But I'm actually, for, I guess for a few reasons, wondering whether we're actually, never mind the COVID crisis, we're actually chasing a productivity solution, which we won't necessarily find. And then we'll be tied to the idea that we can't get working time reductions um, because we can't grow that pie with new, with new productivity. And I'm just slightly wary of that. I mean, one example, the, the Communication Workers Union in, in the UK, who are, you know, we collaborate, autonomy collaborates with a lot, they're, of, they're campaigning for shorter working hours and they've won one hour. And they, they, they basically are campaigning for a few hours over a, a period of years. And that's because of uh, mechanization in, in the workplace. So sorting of letters and stuff. You, you, you know this. Um, and so the, to, to some extent, they're campaigning on work intensification and use of technology in the workplace, less around productivity gains, although that's obviously kind of part of it. I just wonder if the angle on technology is less about should should we solve productivity as an issue everyone should do better and rather everyone should be having reduced working time anyway because we live in an incredibly unequal society and actually the distribution of that wealth or the redistribution should come forth in the form of time um so whether i'm just i'm just worried about productivity as an angle because it doesn't seem to be happening basically and i i feel like we're going to get trapped in a in a demand that, which won't come through sorry maybe i'm just reiterating the same point yeah, no, well, I do think, I mean, in the UK, I mean, that you, you have a problem that other places don't have, which is that low productivity trap. I mean, one could say uh, probably the nature, you know, the high levels of inequality and class problems that you have or, you know, might well be at the root of your productivity problems and that you really need to kind of have inequality in uh, reducing policies very core to whatever you whatever you do, uh, because that's that's a big structural problem that you have as an economy. Um, but I also think that that sort of tendency to think, OK, we have low productivity, we're just going to be against productivity and we're all going to decline more gracefully and more equally, which is, you know, that's a big theme in British culture. Uh, I wouldn't go that's not I what I'm wouldn't, saying. You know that's I not what I'm saying. I wouldn't go in that direction. <laughs> you know I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm not saying no, let's decline gracefully. The, no, I'm not saying you are, but that's there. That's for sure there in the British discourse, right? Mm, no, you're right. No, you're right, totally. And I don't want to fall into the trap of being like, we can't have nice things because we're declining. Um, I'm just saying we can have nice things because we there may because basically there, there are nice things but only a few people have them. That's what I'm saying. And if yeah. I may, um, if I may interject, um, just a quick um, um, note. Um, there has been excellent research by the ILO in the past um, showing that actually um, shorter working hours are also induce productivity growth. So I think it would be kind of um, sad to say, okay, we're not going for shorter working times because we're waiting for productivity to, to increase at some point, but rather you could also think about how can um, working time reductions be designed to actually facilitate productivity growth. And then, then I think it's, you can combine these two debates rather neatly, um, I would suggest. Um, if I may, um, I'd like to ask another question, which relates, I think, also to the um, gender time gap that Beata mentioned. Um, and uh, the question is the following. Um, the question is whether the presenters believe working time reductions would reduce the number of workers in involuntary part-time contracts. I mean, that's the hope to redistribute work, right? or whether, uh, to the contrary, it might actually lead to a further precarity, well, to more precarious jobs, for example, um, self-employment, because instead of hiring people, which you then have to pay full-time for only four days um, of work, you instead um, try to get rid of your workers all in all, and then just to 
um, um, have them as uh, private contractors, so to speak, which has been a strong tendency in a lot of European uh, labor markets. So um, redistribution or um, further um, involuntary self-employment, what do you think? Let, I, I talked a lot. I talked so, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I was yes, thinking of Beata actually. Okay, yes, um, you have this te uh, this this tendency in um, in um, in um, in um, that the contracts and in involuntary employment, the tendency is there, and I don't think that it will strengthen when we have uh, the reduction of working time, because when we have the reduction of working time, we have this tendency by VW, for example, in Germany, you have a lot of self-contractors and you have less normal jobs, which are paid very good with the normal uh, tariff track of the IG Metall. And this is a problem we are looking with, which we have in the moment. And if you, we reduce the working time, I think this wouldn't change anything. Mm. Um, if we reduce the working time, we have other conditions for the normally employed people. And then I think, and I, I want to strengthen this once more, there is much more music inside this mo model than often the people say, because if we have a radical, we don't speak about one hour or two, if we have a radical um, reduction of working time, it's 30 hours per week or less, it's in the direction of 20 hours per week. Then we will get a completely other society. That's it. And we will get a completely other distribution of paid and unpaid work between men and women. That this is the key. And I think most of the people don't see that this is the key. If we have only 25 hours per week, which is a normal job, a normal full-time job. Let's speak about how it is paid. And if we have a full wage, um, wage um, or not, this can be discussed later. But we should discuss first, if we have 25 hours, it's a full-time job, for example, then we have a complete other distribution and we will get women in full-time jobs because the full-time job is completely other defined and we get men in full-time jobs with a completely other defined level of full-time job and so in this we will have another distribution of the unpaid work and we will have another distribution of insurance uh, and another distribution of payment and everything and so it's a completely change mm -hmm. and uh, if we say, oh, this will come to more self-employment, this will come to worse conditions, and then I will say, no, this is another point, this is another problem, and this problem we have to solve with other instruments. And I think the good unions may have instruments in Germany, I can speak for Germany, to solve that, and that they have to think together with the um, force with the event now to go into the working time debate as um, so, uh, Sophie Jennecke said from the IG Metall. I think that's that, that's very good that the IG Metall is now uh, looking and thinking about to reinforce the working time debate again. And uh, yes, I think uh, this will be the societal project which is, is the key project for the next years. And only with this project, we can in to uh, development in the post coast society. This will be the first step and this will be the condition. And this will make new coalitions, new coalitions between trade unions and um, NGOs like Fridays for Future. This is the way to get this no, new coalitions, only this, because the, the, the trade unions, they won't fight for ecology uh, with um, ecological arguments because they have to look for the work and how to organize the work and working time is one central point of it. 
Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to directly follow this up to all three of you, um, because there has been a question before. Will already wrote um, an answer um, in written form, but I think I'd like to also have um, the other two perspectives and maybe Will wants to expand on the question. Um, well, uh, Juliet mentioned in her talk that um, shaming environmentally damaging consumption does not work. Yeah, and Will mentioned that post work offers a positive vision of hope for people. Yeah, something that is actually desirable. And the question was that um, whether you see any potentials that NGOs that are today um, campaigning for uh, um, a reduction in consumption um, instead switch to the messaging of, well, we have to fight for working time reductions and that might be a compensation for a reduction in consumption also or is going or do you think working time reductions will stay a topic of the trade unions primarily i mean we were already talking about new strategic alliances and so on this might be something to bring together trade unions and environmental organizations but maybe you have some insight from contact with these organizations or at least some hopes. Yeah. I mean, do, do you want me to go or I, I'm, I'm holding back because I talked a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think you can start. Okay, I'll start. So, I mean, I think, I think yeah, I, 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 as I wrote in the chat, I think there needs to be alliances of all sorts of organizations. Look, I think, I think you know, historically trade unions have, trade unions have been at the heart of working time reduction campaigns and they still are the, the existing ones Iga Metal or in the UK I've already mentioned some but at the same time there are different capacities of different organizations with different audiences basically and I think you know those those groups like Fridays for Future and similar environmental groups they need to they speak in their own particular language to and give their own particular reasons and um, tomorrow, I'm sure in the sessions in this conference, you'll hear from different campaigns and how they speak in what registers they speak in. And I think it's really important to have an activist wing of this working time movement, as well as a research wing, as well as those people talking to policymakers, those people doing data analysis, those people uh, in trade unions who are talking about, you know, worker freedom, work life balance and things like that. Not one organization can't do all of that. And I think you'll need to have a, a wide spread. And I think actually the premise of this conference actually and, and the network that we're part of is to kind of develop that strategy and that kind of um, kind of like in, the infrastructure for that to happen. So I think yeah, the question is a really good one because ultimately we shouldn't put our hopes in one form of organization. I think we should put them uh, you know, in, in, in the, the fact that people are pushing this in different ways um, and providing different resources. So I, I, I think ultimately, and that's to, to be fair, that in the last five years, that has been why there's been success, right? There's been, on the one hand, we need trade unions talking about this, but on the other hand, you have, um, you know, kind of public intellectuals, you have campaign groups, you have NGOs, you have um, policy, like think tanks, now waking up to the idea and it's become so much stronger and they reinforce each other right so the think think tanks look to trade unions to see how are they campaigning like this you know um we look at companies who are already running this four day weeks in their companies and we work with them to help design those things so it's 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 a it's a mutually reinforcing infrastructure basically um yeah i just to to uh, piggyback on that. I mean, absolutely, it has to be a wide, a wide set of constituent groups. But I think one point, and it relates to a lot of what people are asking in the Q and A, is, I mean, just to put it in its simplest terms, is working time reduction a sufficient strategy, a necessary strategy, or both? And I would say it's certainly a necessary part of a successful transformation uh, with a, a robust climate agenda for emissions reductions, it's by no means sufficient. And there's just, there's a, there's a lot of other, uh, there are a lot of other things that need to be put in place. Obviously, I mean, if we're talking about energy system transformation and then someone asked about uh, transportation and, you know, that it's, we know that to decarbonize our economies, it, it takes a lot of, of change in, in many different ways. We're going to have to do all those things. It's going to, 
So it, it's really important not to think of it as a magic bullet that all you have to do is reduce work time and all these other things just wonderfully happen. I mean, I think there are important uh, dynamics that are set in place with reduced work time, but they can also have rebound effects or unintended consequences. And, and so we really need to, to remember that. Um, I do think it's necessary because otherwise, uh, you, you can get more unemployment and, you know, just problematic dimensions. Um, but but I, I just, I kind of wanted to make that point because there were, you know, quite a few of the, the questions were really, um, were, are really relevant to that, to that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I got a message that Margarita Steinrück would also like to comment. Um, Beata, would you... Uh, I give her the floor for a moment. Yes, 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 surely. Okay, <laughs> okay. Margarita, uh, you, uh, yeah, you should be able to speak now. Okay, yes, I um, uh, agree with uh, Juliet. Uh, sure, the working time reduction is not the single um, measure uh, what will help us in the uh, uh, climate uh, uh, crisis uh, fight. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think there is a lot of um, uh, aspects uh, why it's really necessary and some of the points uh, mentioned before I think um, are not in that um, uh, risk what some people um, assume. Um, first, um, the gender inequality uh, reinforcing, maybe. This is really, as uh, Beata already said, it's only when you let working time reduction in the form of individual part-time work, as it is in the moment. But because of that, we uh, in the trade unions and the women's organizations and, for example, our left party in Germany are fighting for a new working time standard around the 30 hours for everybody that really the men, especially the men, reduce their normal working time. And only then you will have this effect that uh, really every work, the paid and the unpaid, could be um, uh, shared equally. Uh, we have an experience uh, with the uh, Volkswagen uh, experiment in, in uh, the 90s. Uh, there uh, was really one effect of this uh, 28 hours uh, uh, a week that men did uh, um, share more of the uh, uh, work at home. And um, uh, the, the uh, uh, ideology uh, of all the conservative was they will only work a second job or something like that in their free time. This was not the case. Yeah? And um, um, uh, sorry. Um, else the question, uh, how the discussion inside the trade unions uh, uh, about the relation of less consume or less uh, working time. I think at the moment, most of the normal workers really um, are almost afraid to lose the job. And this is the main motivation for everything. And in so far, um, I think we have to, to combine uh, the, um, how to say, to um, make a picture of working time reduction as a means for safe jobs 
as it is actually um, with the uh, Kurzarbeit, uh, short time work uh, as a state uh, measure. With this um, perspective to have a new wealth, a new well, uh, wealth of nations in form of more free time. Because really many, many uh, of uh, also normal workers are suffering from too much intense work and too long uh, work. And we have such a rate of burnouts and uh, uh, also family uh, conflicts because of <coughs> so long working time that uh, the, 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 the desire to really have more time for family, for friends, for myself, is a big driver in all these struggles. And this would be the, 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 the art of uh, mobilization for this question to combine these two motives, to have more free time and to have save, to save the job. I'd like to yes. follow. Oh, yes, sorry. We are very strange in this. Is, uh, yeah. If you look at the surveys, most of the people, they say, we want to work less. We want to work less when we are in a full-time job. And this argument, you see it everywhere, that the people, they want to have more time. And it's a welfare of time, which becomes more and more important. And I think this is an argument we have to see, which will be also very important for post society, the post coast society, only everybody speaks about carbon and carbon emissions and how can we, we um, de decline them. But we also have to see, we want to speak about quality of life. We have to speak of the quality of life in a post carbon society. And this is also a quality of time. We, do, we don't as stress the whole time because we have to do this and this and this. I have to, to, to stop my job and I have to look for the children and I have to go to the kindergarten and, and then so that we have to share the time. And this is also one argument when we speak about gender. If the women will participate in the jobs as much as the men, then you have to share, you have to share the time. And this means it is not possible that 40 hours work a man and 30 hours works a woman and they both have two children. 40 years ago the man worked 40 hours and uh, the woman was at home and cared for the children and now we have to do a new distribution of the working hours and but in the result it has to become less in working hours because we have to save the climate and we have to change productivity. And this was the argument we had before. It is not enough. It is important. It is an important key, but we have to change the working, the, um, the, um, the kind of work we do. And this is meant with transformation. We are full in transformation of in the social and ecological transformation of the automobile sector, of the steel industry, of all. And this we must, um, we, we, we must do, we, we, we must um, uh, fill with, with life and the working time reduction is one instrument, but only one instrument. We also, we have to look how we can produce in another way, how we can change mobility and all these things. If I, I, I would like to suggest we take one last question from the audience and then we might make our final round and conclude because you only have um, 11 minutes left. And the question I was wondering about because Margareta highlighted the, the fear of unemployment and um, since it's also a policy that is often promoted as um, being an, a way to move towards a more sustainable and a more caring society. I wanted to highlight the question from the audience, whether you think a UBI, a universal basic income, is an alternative um, to work in time reductions or might actually be complementary because it's a part wage compensation, for instance, if you work less. Yeah, so um, that would be the last question I would suggest from the audience. 
Who would like to go first? Go on, Julian. Me? Yeah, okay. Oh, speaking of, I, I mean, I, I, I've talked the most, but for me, it's complimentary. I mean, I think one of the really great things about UBI, other than all of the, the benefits that it gives to people and the, you know, human, uh, human uh, welfare improvements associated with it are that it can actually lead fewer people to work and reduce people's working hours and so forth. So I, I think it's a big benefit in that sense is something that can help a society move to lower levels of work effort. Um, so, yeah. Um, yes. Um, do you want to go yeah, please. Yes, I completely agree to this. I think it is complementary. I'm. Um, I think basic income is necessary. It is necessary also because that the people don't have fear to become unemployed, and somebody who says I want to work to work in the paid job, I want to work in society issues in own work. This is also okay, I think, and for that the basic income is the condition to have the possibility to do that. So I think, yes, both is important for the post school society, the, both, the basic income and the reduction of the working time. Thank you. And well, I assume you as a post-work proponent, you're probably not adamantly against the UBI, but if you would also like to comment briefly. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just going to reiterate something Margareta said about if you look at the history of welfare, often, although welfare is something we really value, particularly the post-war welfare state, it's often been used as a stick to beat workers with. So if you look at the workhouse in the 19th century and you look at the job centre in the UK and the unemployment centres in the US and so on, too often they are dis disciplinary institutions with conditional um, uh, requirements so that you can only get support if you're looking for a job and so on. They are... They are places of, to dissuade people to, you know, to kind of go on to these um, uh, social security nets. And so I think a, a basic income would be a total game changer in terms of not having that fear of being out of a job. Um, and, it, you know, it, for all sorts of reasons, um, it'll, it'll be a good thing. So I think in terms of linking with working time, I think it's, it's part of like a new economic setup, basically. So I, I fully agree. Okay, thank you so much for, well, um, a very uh, intense debate and also three excellent inputs. And we, we agreed in the beginning, beginning that we would make a last uh, round where you have the chance to wrap um, um, your position up a little bit if you, if you would like to. Other than that, you can also pass it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, who, who would like to start? With the final round? Yes, I, I, I yeah. think I said it in my last point. I think uh, the working time reduction concept is underestimated because it is a central key for the change in uh, post course society and it is a central key for gender justice because women have the same right to come into the paid jobs, but it is necessary and it is important that all the people who don't want to go in paid jobs that they have the possibility and for that the basic income is an added concept is concurrent is also very important for this thinking of new arrangements of work and thirdly and not last we have to have a concept of so social ecological transformation and this concept must be done must be created together trade unions and ecological organizations like um, Fridays for Future but also other organizations and the trade unions they have to come in to discuss about other concepts of production and to think reproduction in the world too. We don't have to see linear concepts, we have to, to see cycle concepts for the future. Yes. Thank you. Juliet, would you like to go yeah. next? So uh, one of the things we haven't talked about uh, too much is how uh, a program of work time reduction would affect the distribution of power in society. And if we think about 
the neoliberal era, you know, one of the, the most important things in addition to the ecological and climate destruction that's occurring is the destruction of, of power for ordinary people and the growth of power of elites, business, uh, and their representatives in the state. And the, uh, you know, a key foundation, as, as people have been talking, uh, it, uh, to um, the power of capital over labor is people's fear of unemployment, fear of losing jobs. And when you shift to work time reduction, you have uh, it affects, you have fewer people unemployed, you have a lower cost of job loss. UBI also does a lot with this. And so um, to the extent that we believe getting the kind of society we want requires much more pow people power, that is power vested in ordinary people and less in elites, uh, work time reduction should, should really help us with that because it, it transforms the dynamics of of labor markets uh, in the same way that I think we understand UBI does as well. So it, you know, that's a kind of positive rebound or positive uh, knock-on effect that you get from uh, working time reduction that will make possible many of the kinds of things that we were talking about in the Bayada, especially has been, you know, talking about in this session around quality of life. Yeah, thanks for, for reinforcing this point in the end, because I think it's also very crucial to the demand for shorter working times. Will, you are the last one. No, I, I haven't got much more to add. It's been a great session, and I look forward to kind of taking these conversations into tomorrow, and then also you know working together as part of that kind of ensemble of actors uh, pushing this issue. It's, it's got to happen. Yeah, I, um, uh, well, now I will say what I wanted to say. <laughs> so that only leaves me to thank you once more and um, to hand over to Adrien, who will conclude the day very shortly, give an outlook for tomorrow. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.